Workers of Tokyo Electric Power Company are ready to move more than a thousand units of spent fuel rods from the reactor building at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. They're calling this the first milestone of the decommissioning process, even as they continue to struggle with numerous problems such as contaminated water. In today's Nuclear Watch, a U.S. expert advising TEPCO talks about what the company needs to do to move forward. NHK World's Yoichiro Tateiwa reports. Please have a seat over Thank here. you. Lake Barrett is a former director of the U.S. nuclear watchdog. He directed the decommissioning of the Three Mile Island power plant after its meltdown in 1979. He worked together with the utility company as a government expert to clean up the reactor. Now, Barrett is offering advice on dealing with the contaminated water and the decommissioning operation. He says he sees no technical problems so far. From a technical point of view, okay, uh, as far as public health and safety is concerned, TEPCO is doing a good job in my view. But he says TEPCO has not been successful in fostering public trust. He says TEPCO should have been more upfront about the situation of contaminated water leaking into the ocean. And some people I've heard say, uh, TEPCO said it wasn't leaking and it was leaking and they lied to us. I don't think that's fair to say of TEPCO. I don't think they were intentionally lying. Now maybe you should have TEPCO gone back and said, let me explain about water. We have all kinds of water. Rainwater has a little bit of tritium or a little bit of something in it and it goes in there and, it, and it's going into the ocean. Should have they have said that? Hindsight? I wish they had. He also pointed out that it is important to stand by the affected communities. At the time of the Three Mile Island accident, he says he moved into the area with his family. I cannot go there and be the spokesman for this without my family there and say my children go to school here. My, I can see the cooling towers from my house because they're going to say, well, you're just from Washington and you're here and you come here during the week and you go home on the weekend and you don't want to have your kids here. So the people would not trust what I would say. But if I could say to them, I live here, you know, I'm part of this community, this was an important thing as far as the people having trust and confidence in, in me being running the organization. He says TEPCO needs to work out its own way of building a relationship with local residents and the public. He says the only way for TEPCO to successfully accomplish the operation is by restoring trust. Restoring trust is an important part of success, um, but you can't restore trust without, uh, by saying, trust me. You have to basically prove to people through your actions that you're trustworthy. TEPCO workers will soon start removing spam fuel rods from the number four reactor building. This is the real start of a decommissioning process that will take up to 40 years. Barris says he cannot overemphasize the importance of transparency every step of the way. Yoichiro Tateiwa, NHK World. Now in Japan, a group of government officials has decided to come clean and admit that residents of Fukushima may never return to their homes. They say that radiation levels there cannot be brought back to normal anytime soon and are urging the leadership to abandon its promise to make the area fit for living in. But only a handful of those residents actually want to go back more than two years after an earthquake and tsunami crippled the Daiichi nuclear power plant. And here's one of the main reasons for that. Ideally, the radiation level should be just one milliserviette per year, since this is an unreachable target for Japan. The government reportedly hopes to ensure people aren't exposed to doses of more than 20 times that. However, in some of the worst affected areas, Geiger counters show measurements of around 50 times the recommended level, and that's halfway to cancer-causing levels. RT's Alexei Yaroshevsky brings us this report from the Exclusion Zone. It's hard to say what gives you a creepier feeling, the trail of destruction left by the 2011 tsunami, or the houses untouched by natural disaster but abandoned after the nuclear accident. Walking through the deserted streets of the Fukushima exclusion zone, we can see plenty of both.
Technically, we're now well within the Fukushima no-go zone. We're just 10 kilometers from the nuclear power station. These houses ravaged by the tsunami in 2011 still stand here, nowhere near to being restored. You'd be surprised to learn that radiation levels here are in fact lower than in some of the European cities. And this prompted the decision by the Japanese government to allow the people to return to their homes. But scientists say that's suicidal because radiation migrates and because it exists in hot spots scattered all across the area. In the hot spots there is a, a huge amount of the radioactive material is concentrated and stored. It is almost impossible to find out all the hotspots to shut down or remove all the radioactive contaminated material from their houses. We actually stumbled upon this process. Radiated material from personal belongings to contaminated soil is put in plastic bags and buried. The radiation meter went berserk even from a considerable distance. Imagine our surprise when we found similar levels in an area which had never been included in the no-go zone. I've traveled to the Chernobyl exclusion zone more than a dozen times and this was probably the scariest episode when we put a radiation meter on the ground on a layer of moss and it produced more than 800 microrongians per hour. That is 40 times more than the normal human radiation level. Here, 60 kilometers from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The readings are certainly less than that. This is close to the average level of the ghost town of Pripyat in the Chernobyl zone. Only with one exception, the place where I'm at right now, more than 10,000 people are currently living. Mrs. Morizono is one of them. She bought a radiation meter and now patrols the area looking for hotspots. We had after-school classes for children at our house, but had to close it because of high radiation. In her short life, this girl has already got used to seeing a lot of radiation meters. Just like Mrs. Morizono, her mother joined an NGO group of ordinary women, united by fear for the future of their children and distrust of the government's actions. We're sending our data to government and TEPCO officials every day, and we get no reply. Don't see any action from them. As if they're trying to play down the scale of things. Meanwhile, our children are already suffering from thyroid issues. The voice of dissent is now intensifying, despite assurances from TEPCO as spent nuclear fuel rods are removed from Reactor 4 at Fukushima Daiichi. We have it under control. It's a challenging process, but we have the equipment to perform it. Anti-nuclear protesters in Tokyo say no one should be allowed back into the Fukushima area until it's completely safe, which in truth may not happen for centuries. Their picket has just surpassed 800 days, and they will stay longer, they say, to force their government into rethinking its nuclear policies. Alexei Roshevsky, RT, reporting from Japan. Farmers in northern Fukushima prefecture are preparing dried persimmons. They say they will be selling it for the first time since voluntarily halting production after the 2011 nuclear crisis. They smoke the persimmons and dry them for about a month to make what's called ampogaki, which is known for its softness. The resumption of production comes after the radiation level of the persimmons before their processing was found to be within the government's safety limit. I have eagerly awaited this. I am happy to be producing again with my colleagues. The farmers plan to continue making the dried fruit until next month when they'll check their safety and ship them to destinations around the country. operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant says it will start removing spent fuel on Monday from the number four reactor building. It's the first step Tokyo Electric Power Company will take toward decommissioning the crippled plant. We decided to start removing fuel on November 18th. 
The building contains more than 1,500 units of fuel rods. Most of them are used and highly radioactive. The fuel is stored in a pool of water which contains the radioactive particles. TEPCO workers will remove it and place it in radiation-proof containers. They'll then transfer them to another location on the plant's premises. The building was badly damaged by a hydrogen explosion in March 2011. So engineers built a steel structure equipped with the crane that will be used to remove the containers. They say the structure can resist earthquakes as strong as the one on March 11. TEPCO officials will start with the unused fuel as they consider it less difficult to handle. They plan to remove the remainder by the end of 2014. The next step will be to remove fuel from the other three reactor buildings. The operators of Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant has announced that it will start removing spent nuclear fuel from the plant starting on Monday. Three reactors at the plant melted down by an explosion in the aftermath of Japan's 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Reactor 4 was one of the worst damaged in the disaster. Removing the fuel rods is the first major step in a decommissioning process at the plant that is expected to last decades. The Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO for short, has prepared a massive steel structure that comes with a remote-controlled crane to remove the fuel rods, which will be placed in a protective cask and transferred to a joint cooling pool inside a nearby building. But recent site mishaps have thrust TEPCO into the spotlight, calling into question its ability to execute a complex cleanup that could last decades. Back in August, almost 300 tons of radioactive water leaked from a tank at the Fukushima plant. The leaks have shaken confidence in the reliability of hundreds of tanks that are crucial for storing water that has been pumped into the broken reactors to keep melted radioactive fuel cool. Scientists are worried that radiation leaking from the plant is making its way across the Pacific Ocean and will likely wash ashore on the west coast of the United States as soon as January. Many scientists say the radioactive water will pose no health risks, but others point to the uncertainty surrounding long-term exposure to radioactivity. As workers proceed with the decommissioning of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, they're faced with a familiar problem, disposing of highly radioactive waste. Some Japanese lawmakers are setting up a group to tackle that issue and find a long-term solution to the country's nuclear waste dilemma. The move comes after former Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi called on Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to promptly end Japan's dependence on nuclear power. Kozumi cited difficulties associated with constructing disposal sites for highly radioactive waste. The new group will include the governing Liberal Democrats, members of ruling coalition partner New Kometo, and the opposition Democrats. The members plan to study how other countries manage the radioactive waste. They'll discuss a wide range of other issues, including the possibility of developing new technology. They also plan to look into ways to decide where disposal sites will be located. The Secretary General of Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party has hinted at the possibility of studying building new nuclear power plants in Japan as long as their safety can be guaranteed. Shigeru Ishiba spoke to reporters on Saturday. Even if the percentage of renewable energy increases in Japan's total power supply, I would not deny the possibility of studying building new nuclear plants from the viewpoint of energy security. However, I don't mean to actively promote building new nuclear plants. The government will first have to restart existing idle plants after ensuring their safety. 
Ishiba said new nuclear plants would be built if safer ones become available in response to the March 2011 accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. He added that theoretically it is impossible to accept restarting existing nuclear plants while rejecting the building of new ones. The U.S. Energy Department has approved a plan involving a major Japanese appliance firm to export natural gas to Japan. Under the plan, Toshiba will secure 2.2 million tons of liquefied natural gas every year. The deal starts in 2019. The natural gas project is in the state of Texas. Toshiba plans to sell the gas to power companies in Japan. Japan has become increasingly dependent on thermal power generation. Natural gas prices in the U.S. have depreciated as the development of shale gas has boomed. The United States put restrictions on natural gas exports to countries like Japan that have no free trade agreements with the U.S. Japan needs to apply to the Energy Department for individual projects. It's the third time Japan has obtained its approval. It's a topic that draws big crowds dumping nuclear waste at a former Nevada test site. Tonight, the second public meeting with the Department of Energy was held as it moves toward the shipment that could come as early as next year. Christine Kim from our Las Vegas station was at that meeting to hear what people had to say. The Department of Energy held this meeting to inform the public. It had presentations and displays to describe the disposal process. And what took much of the time was a question and answer session. How many states is this waste coming from? A line of Pahrump residents sounding off questions and concerns on the Department of Energy's plans to bury 403 canisters of uranium waste at the Nevada National Security Site. Well, I'm concerned about leakage, of course, damage from a variety of aspects. I don't believe that anything would happen. I don't worry about it as much as I worry about goofy people carrying guns on their hips. One of the major concerns, safely transporting the nuclear waste from Tennessee to Nevada. It's the idea that if they do have a spill, uh, that the rest of the world and mostly America will be scared to death of moving to Pahrump. Our concern is the road that it's on because Clark County has made it very clear that they don't want it on any of their highways and it hasn't been. It has been diverted through Pahrump. So we have roads that need uh, mitigation. Frank Marcinowski says a waste will come in the form of ceramic-like solids inside walled steel containers that are robust and durable. There's uh, additional precautions being taken with these particular shipments where they're going to be escorted uh, by the Office of Secure Transport. And so that's an added measure of security for these shipments. The Department of Energy calls it low-level nuclear waste that they've been disposing at the same site since the 1960s. These shipments, however, will require special precautions. Low level is defined uh, that it's not high level waste, it's not spent fuel, it's not transuranic waste, and it's not byproduct material. So if it's not one of those categories, then it's low level waste. It's a disposal plan that Nevada leaders oppose, but the Department of Energy has the authority to move forward. And for those here, it's what some call a done deal. It's got to be brought someplace, and this is it. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm told a working group established by the Energy Secretary and Governor Brian Sandoval will meet in January and discuss some of the topics and the questions brought up in these two meetings. Reporting from Perump, I'm Christine Kim. There are new health and safety concerns for residents of Treasure Island tonight. Our media partner, the Center for Investigative Reporting, has discovered documents detailing an alarming radioactive discovery in the lawns of one neighborhood. ABC 7 News reporter Sergio Quintana is live on Treasure Island now with the story. Sergio. According to state health and safety documents, one of their workers earlier this year found a piece of metal that was so radioactive it could burn the skin and cause ulcerations. The concern is that those fragments are not only being found inside the cordoned off cleanup sites, but could also be found out in the neighborhoods. 
Behind this chain link fence, crews are working on stripping out radioactive and other toxic materials from these buildings. But in a story by our media partner, the Center for Investigative Journalism, state regulators have found radioactive materials outside these fences. One Treasure Island resident who didn't want to use her name said she's worried, especially for her daughter. She's constantly walking around, picking up things, thinking um, that this is a rock. You know, what if she happens to pick up the wrong thing? Earlier this year, California Department of Public Health workers found radioactive shards buried in the lawns of some housing units. Andre Patterson says his brother lives right next to where they recently found a highly radioactive hunk of metal. All these spots here or where the radiation was. He lives in subsidized housing and says he was never told about these radioactive risks. If we put you out here on radiation and we fail to disclose this radiation out here because I would never moved on this island here had he told me the radiation. The U.S. Navy left Treasure Island in 1997. It has been cleaning up parcels of contaminated land before turning them over to the city of San Francisco. Environmental advocates say that process is taking a long time because more and more contaminated items are being found. We have people living there and they're living cheek by jowl with materials that we didn't know about. Saul Bloom says the Navy sometimes buried radioactive materials to help train technicians how to find them. Mayor Ed Lee says these new reports are a concern. But there have been no incidents where residents have discovered these radioactive items yet. Uh, there are speculative ideas that if you dig up certain areas, uh, you may find something. That's why we insist that the Navy continue making sure all their cleanup efforts are thorough. More than 500 radioactive fragments have been found by crews since 2011. And in the last hour, we've learned that Supervisor Jane Kim will be available to answer questions for residents concerned about this issue. She will be available at 7 at Casa de la Vista. Reporting live here on Treasure Island, I'm Sergio Quintana, ABC 7 News.